Turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 9. And we're continuing our exposition of the book of Romans and this section, Romans 9 to 11, which deals with a fundamental problem that we see in the verse we're looking at this morning, or rather the half verse we're looking at this morning. We'll be studying together Romans 9, 6a. Paul simply says this, it is not as though the word of God has failed. And Paul's statement here brings us to ask a question. What is Paul talking about? Why would Paul suspect that God's word has failed? After all that he said in Romans 1 through 8, detailing for us the gospel, the power of God for salvation, the the great doctrines of justification, adoption, redemption, propitiation, And the great promises that flow out of God's saving work, that we could never be separated from God's love, that we could never be condemned because God is the one who justifies. And we come to Romans chapter 9, and all of a sudden, this great climactic book takes a downturn. Paul is bummed. He's discouraged. He's saddened significantly. He says in Verse 1 of chapter 9, I'm telling the truth in Christ, I am not lying, my conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart, and I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brother, my kinsmen according to the flesh, Israelites, who had all the privileges listed in verses 4 and 5. The state of Israel in Paul's day was what caused him tremendous sorrow. As he climbed to the the, the soaring heights of the tops of God's salvation history described at the climax of Romans 8, he's up there by himself without his kinsmen according to the flesh, and he wishes they were there. And of all people on the earth, they should have been there. The Jews should have embraced their Messiah. They should have known the promises of God. They should have known and clinged to the covenants. And yet they rejected Messiah and were rejected by God for their unbelief. What has happened? And we ask the question with Paul, has the word of God failed? I want you to turn to Mark chapter 7 for a moment. I want to take a stab at explaining perhaps why we don't feel what Paul feels here. You and I reading Romans 1 to 7, we get Romans 1 to 8, we get to the end of chapter 8 and we would just rejoice. We'd be dancing at the top of the mountain. We're saved. We have our sins forgiven. There's no condemnation and there's no separation. Woo-hoo. We would move right on to the end of Romans chapter 11. From him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And to chapter 12 and say, therefore, how should I live? And we'd move on with Romans. We'd skip 9 to 11. But Romans 9 to 11 exists because there is a fundamental problem. And I think it's a problem that we in the 21st century don't get. Or we have a hard time appreciating There's a scene in Mark 7 that might help us appreciate Paul's sorrow a little bit. Matthew 7, uh, Mark, I'm in the wrong book. Mark 7, verse 24. Then Jesus got up and went away from there to the region of Tyre. And when he had entered a house, he wanted no one to know of it, yet he could not escape notice. But after hearing of him... A woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of the Syrophoenician race. And she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And Jesus was saying to her, Let the children be satisfied first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table feed on the children's crumbs. And he said to her, because of this answer, go, the demon has gone out of your daughter. Does this seem strange? Most of us in this room are Gentiles. 
We might affiliate ourselves with this Syrophoenician woman whose child was plagued mercilessly by a demon. And Jesus has made his way into Gentile territory. We hear about him and and we go and we run to Jesus and we say, Jesus, will you help me? And Jesus says, no. What? What is Jesus doing here? Well, he's putting on display one thing. First of all, salvation came through the Jews. And if a Gentile under the Mosaic Covenant was to come to Yahweh, the Gentile would come through Israel, would meet Yahweh in Israel, would meet Yahweh, the God of Israel, through the religious system of Israel. And God was merciful to Gentiles throughout the Old Testament, and Jesus is merciful to the Syrophoenician woman here. But her mindset is remarkable. Jesus calls his own people the children and the Gentiles the dogs. What is going on here? Jesus is giving opportunity to put her faith on display over against Jewish entitlement. And it is remarkable. She says, yes, but don't the dogs get to eat the crumbs thrown under the table? Jesus, whatever help you would be pleased to give me, I don't deserve it. (laughs) And you see, this is how Gentiles get in. You and I, not privy to the covenants and the promises given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we get in by mercy. We get in by mercy. If we had lived as Gentiles in the first century and had encountered Jesus, we would feel like outsiders crying out for mercy, not as those entitled to God's love. And that's the truth. And that's the truth of anybody, Jew or Gentile. And remember in the first century, the Jewish mindset was, we have Abraham as our father, we're in. The Apostle Paul in Romans 9 to 11 is going to demolish that sentiment. So that in the end, when Jews receive Jesus as Messiah, they will cry out for mercy, not as those entitled. And then we can get to the end of Romans 11, where everyone says, oh, the mercies of God. From him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. You see, God will not have anybody in heaven who believes that they earned it or deserved it or got there by right of birth. God will only have those in heaven who receive his mercy by faith in Messiah. That's where Paul is going with Romans 9 to 11. But we come at Romans from a 21st century, mostly Gentile perspective that for the last 1900 years or so has been predominantly Gentile. And we feel like we belong. And so Paul asks the question, has the word of God failed? And this word for fail in Romans 9, 6, it's used in several other places in the New Testament. In James 1, it it talks about withered flowers whose leaves fall. In Acts 27, 16, it refers to a ship that is drifted off course and run aground. In Galatians 5, 4, Paul uses it to inquire of those who are trying to be justified by law. Have you fallen from grace? Well, let's ask, has the word of God fallen? Fallen, like the withered leaves of a flower? Has it drifted off course and run aground? Has the word of God failed to live up to its purpose? Does God's word do this? We ought to feel this tension that Paul feels here. We ought to read Romans 8 and and, and get a grip of the fantastic promises made there, realizing that these promises are outstanding And we ought to question them. If we were in the first century viewing the state of Israel who had rejected Messiah and was rejected by God for their unbelief in Messiah, we ought to be looking back at all that God had promised to them. God had a people, Israel, and he made promises to them. God, do your promises stand? Can your promises fail? Can your promises go adrift and run aground? 
Can your promises be moved by my disobedience? What a terrifying thing would that be? If Romans 5 and 6 and 7 and 8 could be negated by my sin. Do you understand what's at stake here in the promises of God? If God has reneged on his promises to his people that he made, if God's word has failed, then you and I have no business trusting in God's word. And listen, this probably seems surprising to us because we're 2,000 years removed from the tensions provoked by Romans 9, 6. We're not Jewish, most of us. We're not from the era of believing Jews anticipating Messiah. We're not from the era of Gentile God-fearers attaching themselves to Israel to get to know the God of Israel. We're not the Syrophoenician woman. And perhaps today we're not familiar enough with our Bibles. And perhaps we have become accustomed to thinking of our Bibles a little bit backwards, reading from right to left, rather than reading our Bibles from left to right. God wrote the Bible beginning in Genesis and culminating in Revelation. God wrote in a way for us to read consecutively the way that he has revealed himself. Sometimes I believe we read with a New Testament priority instead of an Old Testament priority. In fact, I think we'll better understand our New Testaments if we understand our Old Testaments better. And not the other way around. And perhaps we've been guilty of something of a narcissistic hermeneutic. Hermeneutic is how we interpret the Bible. And of course, you know Narcissus. He was the guy that saw his reflection in the, in the lake so much. He liked it so much, he dove in after it and drowned. Right? So the narcissist is the, the one who loves himself too much. Do, do we read our Bibles narcissistically? In other words, we think, well, I'm going to open my Bible to something, and, and if it doesn't deal with something in my life right now, on my terms, the way I want it, and be relevant to my situation I need right now, then it's not worth it. It has no value. If it's not about me. And all of a sudden, we turn all of the biblical narrative into an illustrative story of my life. And, and maybe that's not what the Bible's all about. Maybe the Bible is God's story. And perhaps the people in the Old Testament that God dealt with did not exist simply to be an illustration for my Christian life, but were real people with whom God made real promises. Today I want us to almost feel like the Word of God has failed. In other words, I want us to get back to the first century and, and feel Jewish-Gentile tension. And, and feel what Paul must have felt like when his countrymen had not embraced the Messiah that they were supposed to anticipate. What's at stake in this is the very words of God. What's at stake in this is the integrity of God. And John Piper's helpful book, The Justification of God, rightly sees Paul's argument here in Romans 9 as the vindication of God's integrity. This is the vindication of God's integrity. God's integrity is at stake in his promises. God made promises to his people about a people, a land, a blessing, a king, Messiah, about their failure, about exile and return, the rejection of Messiah, their restoration, and best of all, about a relationship to God himself. And we need to reinforce our confidence in God and his promises. I want you to turn to Joshua for a moment. And if you think, if you think about where Joshua is in your Bible, we'll be looking at Joshua 24. The sixth book in your Bible, right after the books of Moses. The people are entering the land. Uh, the people are infiltrating the land of Canaan and uh, they're obeying God sometimes, disobeying God other times. Their task was to eradicate the land of the idolaters that were there. Uh, they didn't do all that they were supposed to do. And, and they needed confidence at the end of Joshua's life as he's handing on the baton to future leaders that God would be faithful. And so in Joshua 24, 14, 
we get a partial answer to the question, does the word of God fail? Here's what Joshua says. I'm sorry, Joshua 23, 14. Joshua says, Behold, today I am going the way of all the earth. And you know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one word of all the good words which Yahweh your God spoke concerning you has failed. All have been met for you. Not one of them has failed. Here's Joshua's confidence that the word of God doesn't fail. And listen, the people of Israel in Joshua's day could look back and see all that God had promised and realize that not one of God's promises had fallen to the ground. Not one of them had drifted off course. And yet, in Joshua's day, when Joshua said this, not all of the promises had yet been fulfilled. Everything that God said was being met right before their eyes. And yet promises like Genesis 3.15, that God would provide a, a seed of Eve that would bring about an end to the curse and a crushing of the head of the snake and forgiveness of sin. Promises about a blessing to Israel and the nation through Abraham in Genesis 12, that a blessing would go to all the nations. There were still outstanding promises of God on the table when Joshua said God's word doesn't fail. This was an injunction of God's people to look back on what God has done in all of his faithfulness. He set his affections on you and he keeps his word. So look to the future and you can trust him. He will keep his promises. I want you to see this in one more place. Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55.11 is a familiar verse and one we often remove from its context. And it, it, its principle is removable, but I want you to see it in its context for a moment. Here's Isaiah 55.11. So will my word be, which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. Here's another, God's word will never fail, verse. And Isaiah 54 and Isaiah 55 are all about Israel's future restoration. A restoration that has not yet happened even to this day. This verse that is about God's word never failing holds out a promise for the people of God, specifically Israel, that has not yet taken place. So it's an interesting dilemma for Paul. Paul the apostle to the Gentiles, who himself is a Jew, who is an enemy of Christ, and then transformed radically by Christ on the road to Damascus. Everywhere he goes, preaches the gospel to the Jew first, then the Gentile. We're going to find out in Romans 9 to 11, he's eager to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, even to provoke his own countrymen to faith. Paul the Apostle lived his life in between advents of Messiah. That is, in between the first coming and the second coming of Christ. Many of the promises that we're going to look at this morning related to Messiah have to do with first coming, and many of them have to do with second coming. And if you were an Old Testament believer, anticipating Messiah's coming and his reign you would have a hard time understanding how can Messiah be both a suffering servant and a reigning king? How does that work? How can he both be impoverished and humiliated and the ruler of the world? How could he be both of these things? How could there be an earthly kingdom to overthrow all other earthly kingdoms and he come and be crushed for other people's sins? And an Old Testament saint, not recognizing there is a first and a second coming of Messiah, would have a difficult spot understanding how all of this works together. And Paul, the apostle, 
lived in between those, just as you and I do. And so Paul is wrestling with the question of, okay, Israel, you were anticipating your Messiah. He came. He was here. We killed him. Why, of all people, is Israel not believed? Here's the main point this morning. Israel's rejection of Messiah poses a problem for the integrity of God's word. And a survey of God's promises concerning Israel will help us feel the angst of the Apostle Paul. What I want to do this morning is look back at our Old Testaments and survey some of the promises that God had made to Israel. Let's look at this Word of God. Let's look at what it is that Paul refers to when he says, it's not as though the Word of God has failed. What word is he speaking about? I think the context of Romans 9, 6 makes it clear from verses 4 and 5 that he's referring to these things that were privileges of the Israelites. To them belonged the adoption as sons, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the temple services, the promises, the fathers, and from whom is Messiah, who is God over all. So I want to lay out for us this morning a series of the promises that God made concerning Israel. Just so that we feel the tension that Paul wants us to feel in Romans 9. And the first is a promise of a people. We're going to be in many places in the Bible this morning as we take this survey. So have your hands ready. By the way, I've written all of these references down for you on the web outline. You do not need to get carpal tunnel syndrome this morning. I'm trying to copy all these down. Uh, they're available for you on the website. But let's begin with Genesis 12. 1 to 3. This is commonly referred to as the Abrahamic covenant. This is God's unilateral promise with Abraham. By the way, was Abraham a Jew or a Gentile? Yes. <laughs> there were no Jews at this time. Uh, Abraham becomes the father of the nation. He's also the father of other nations, we'll learn. But he's an idolater. He's a polygamist idolater uh, in Babylon, and God, by grace, calls him to himself and enters into relationship with him. Yahweh said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, I will make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed." What does God promise Abraham here? These are the first three levels of the promise we're looking at. A people, a land, and a blessing. God promises Abraham that he will be a great people. That, that a great people will come from him. And he promises him further a land. A land he's never been to that's going to belong to him and to his descendants. And then he promises a blessing that is, you're going to be blessed, Abraham, because I'm setting my affections upon you. And through you, notice, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, here's a hint at what God is going to be up to through Israel. Ultimately, blessings to every tongue and tribe and people and nation. Now, the unfolding kindness of God, the unfolding grace of God in setting his affections on one man and one people results in God making unilateral promises to Abraham. By the way, these promises are reaffirmed in Genesis 15 and Genesis 17 to Abraham. In a remarkable scene, you, you know that the, the, the verb to make a covenant is simply the word to cut. A covenant is something that you cut. You cut a deal. You cut a covenant. And, and that imagery comes from what would happen when a solemn covenant was taken by two parties. Uh, animals were, were placed between the two parties and those animals were cut in half and the two parties walked together between the halves of the animals in a symbolic gesture of saying, if I break my end of the bargain, then may what has happened to these animals happen to me. This is a serious agreement. This is not just a gentleman's handshake. This is death to me if I break my covenant. And when God enters into this covenant with Abraham, he puts Abraham to sleep, and God himself, in a manifest way, goes through the animal pieces by himself. 
This signifies a unilateral, unconditional covenant. God's making promises. Not conditioned on Abraham. Conditioned only on the integrity of God. And this gets reaffirmed to Abraham's descendants. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all become recipients of this same promise, which means that promise is narrowed through that line to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We'll find out in Romans 9 that Paul is very careful in the way he describes this. Not every descendant of Abraham is a Jew. right? The Arabs are descendants of Abraham. The Edomites are descendants of Abraham. But a Jew is one who is of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's interesting to watch who the seed of Abraham are, and then to watch who ethnically is a Jew through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we'll watch that unfold in Romans 9. So God promised them a people. And God was faithful to uh, create this people, establish this people, give this people a constitution. He carefully incubated this fledgling people. Uh, from 12 guys to 70 guys, and then Egyptian slavery for 400 years, and they came out at 2 million people. And God protected them under the world's superpower of that day to keep them uh, from being endangered by roving bands. God also promised a land. It's there in Genesis 12, 1 to 3. You also have a, a couple other references there, and we'll get to Amos 9, 11 to 15 later. What's interesting um, about Amos 9... Well, let's turn there. Turn in your Bible. Amos is a little bit hard to find. Um, go to the section of the prophets. Psalms go slightly to the right. And then you have Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, and Amos. I had to write that down to make sure I know where to find Amos on the spot. This unilateral promise from God to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that the, the land of Canaan or the land of Palestine or the land of Israel would belong to Israel it was not a temporary promise. Amos, the prophet, is, is speaking about a future restoration that has not yet happened. And he says this in verse 11 to 15. In that day, I will raise up the fallen booth of David, I will wall up its breaches. I will also raise up its ruins and rebuild it as the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, declares Yahweh who does this. Behold, days are coming, declares Yahweh, when the plowman will overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows seed, when the mountains will drip with sweet wine and all the hills will be dissolved. Also, I will restore the captivity of my people Israel, and they will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will also plant vineyards and drink their wine and make gardens and eat their fruit. I will also plant them on their land, and they will not again be rooted out from their land, which I have given them, says Yahweh your God. And you can trace this land promise from Genesis 12 all the way through the prophets and discover that God has made a unilateral promise for Israel, related to the land. The third promise that we'll look at is the promise of blessing. And we just read this in Genesis 12, that God promised through Abraham to be a blessing to not only the nation that descends from him, but to all the families of the earth. And very early in biblical history, we see our place in God's redemptive history, that he intends to bring blessing to people from every tongue and tribe and nation and people. 1 Kings 8 details Solomon's prayer at the dedication of the temple. And there, Solomon, king over Israel, actually implores the Lord to be kind to foreigners who come to Israel to worship Yahweh. And he pleads with Israel to be faithful to Yahweh so that the watching world will worship the one true God. Solomon recognized that in Israel's day, uh, her mission was to make their God known to the world. And they were to do so by being faithful, by being faithful to him. Of course, Solomon did not do that, and the people did not do that, and disastrous results came from that. A fourth line of God's promise concerning Israel is a king. Genesis 49.10, you remember that Jacob, who's, who was renamed Israel, he had sons who become the tribes of Israel, 
Jacob makes a, uh, a promise, a blessing concerning Judah, his son, in Genesis 49.10. And Jacob, or Israel, says this about his son Judah. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of all the peoples. A somewhat cryptic reference here to Jesus himself, the descendant, the lion of the tribe of Judah, who when he comes will be king over all peoples, over all the earth. In 2 Samuel 7, God makes this promise to David, reaffirms David is of the line of the tribe of Judah. And God promises David that this line of the throne that will never be removed from him will come through David's line, and it would come through Solomon's line. And 2 Samuel 7 makes it clear that some in David's line would be sinners. <laughs> but there's eventually one coming who would not be a sinner, for whom the kingdom would be established forever, in the line of Judah, in the line of David. Psalm 2 and Psalm 110 both detail this coming king. They detail not only a king over Israel, but a king over all the earth. One of the promises that Israel was looking forward to was this new Davidic king who would reign on the earth. Psalm 2 says he would rule the nations with a rod of iron. Another promise given to Israel was the relationship to God himself. Turn to Genesis 17. What we find here is a refrain that shows up over and over again in the Old Testament. Genesis 17, verse 8. Here's the reaffirmation of the promise of the land. And God says to Abram, I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. This is a remarkable statement that the God of the universe, the God who needs nothing, the God who, upon whom everything depends is going to enter into relationship with people. And throughout the Old Testament, you get this refrain, I will be their God and they will be my people. What a remarkable promise. God also makes a promise concerning Israel related to their rebellion. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 28. There are systems of theology today that would say that Israel, since they rejected Messiah, since they've been disobedient, they have forfeited promises. The problem with that view is that God knew they would forfeit the promises as he made the promises. Deuteronomy 28 and 29 are part of the constitutional documents of the nation of Israel. They're there at the very founding. And God says this about Israel, verse 15 of Deuteronomy 28, it shall come about if you do not obey Yahweh your God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I charge you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Verse 36, Yahweh will bring you and your king whom you set over you to a nation which neither you nor your fathers have known, and there you shall serve other gods, wood and stone. You'll become a horror. Verse 47, because you did not serve Yahweh your God with joy and a glad heart. Verse 63, it shall come about that as Yahweh delighted over you to prosper you and multiply you, so Yahweh will delight over you to make you perish and destroy you, and you will be torn from the land where you are entering to possess. You see, the, the rebellion of Israel is not a surprise to God. Israel being cut off in Paul's day for unbelief is not plan B for God. This is all part of what God planned from the beginning. Next, a promise concerning Israel's exile. We see this in Deuteronomy 29, beginning in verse 22. Now the generation to come, your sons who rise up after you and the foreigner who comes from a distant land, when they see the plagues of the land and the diseases which the Lord has afflicted it, they will say... All its land is brimstone and salt, a burning waste, unsown and unproductive, and no grass grows on it. 
All the nations will say, verse 24, why has Yahweh done this to this land? Why this great outburst of anger? They will say, verse 25, because they forsook the covenant of Yahweh, the God of their fathers, which he made with them. They served other gods, verse 26. Down in verse 29, or verse 28, the Lord uprooted them from their land in anger and in fury and in great wrath and cast them into another land as it is to this day. The exile of Israel from the promised land was no surprise to God, as what God promised for their disobedience. And God also promised their return. Deuteronomy 30, verses 1 to 6. And it's interesting chronology here, verse 28. God says, you'll be blessed and prosperous in the land if you obey me. You'll be cursed and things will go bad for you if you disobey me. You will disobey me. I will exile you to another land and I will bring you back. Verse chapter 30. Verse 2. You return to the Lord with uh, your God and obey him with all your heart and soul according to all that I command you today, you and your sons. Then Yahweh your God will restore you from captivity, have compassion on you, and will gather you again from all the people where Yahweh your God has scattered you. And look down at verse 6. Moreover, Yahweh your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love Yahweh your God with all your heart and with all your soul so that you may live. In other words, God has promised to Israel a restoration to the land and repentance, spiritual life, what he calls here circumcision of the heart. God promised to Israel the Messiah. Isaiah 7 and Isaiah 9 promised the one who would come. It talks about where he would be born, what he would be like, who he is. This is Emmanuel, God with us. God also promises concerning Israel the rejection of Messiah. Turn to Isaiah 53. This familiar text about Christ crucified, risen and ascended and glorified for the purpose of bringing sinners to himself really is a dirge, a lament of Israel. Look at Isaiah 53, verse 2. Speaking of Jesus, the Messiah, he grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of parched ground. He had no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and, notice, we, Israel, did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, our sorrows he carried. We ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. So the Jews would not consider a, a crucified man anything like a Messiah. They were expecting a king to rule the earth with a rod of iron. And here, God's suffering servant crushed at the hands of of his father, crushed under God, cursed by him, hanging on a tree, killed by mere men. And Isaiah says that Israel despised Messiah. God knew that Jesus the Messiah would be the stone that the builders rejected. Psalm 118. God also promised Gentile salvation Look at Psalm 22, verse 27. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to Yahweh, and all the families of the nations will worship before you. For the kingdom is Yahweh's, and he rules over the nations. What a remarkable promise through Israel's songwriter. And look at Isaiah 49, verse 6. Isaiah writes, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob 
and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also make you a light of the nations, so that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. You wonder if the Syrophoenician woman had read Isaiah. Can I have some of the crumbs? This Messiah of Israel is to be a light to the nations. It's remarkable Old Testament promises also include a promise of repentance. You've got a number of references there. I want you to turn to Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah, by the way, is a post-exilic prophet. That means he wrote and prophesied after Israel was away in Babylonian captivity and then brought back to the land. And when Israel came back to the land, they were never again a nation. They never had all of the land that God had promised. Uh, They were not a a sovereign nation over their own people. Um, They were subjected by the, the, the ruling powers, the Greeks and the Romans. And they never embraced God faithfully as a nation. Not yet. Zechariah, writing after their return to the land, after the exile, prophesies about a yet future time. And he says, beginning in verse 8, In that day Yahweh will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the one who is feeble among them in that day will be like David, and the house of David will be like God, like the angel of Yahweh before them. And in that day, I will set about to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication, so that they will look on me, that is Yahweh, whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. Look down at chapter 13, verse 1 of Zechariah. In that day, a fountain will be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and impurity. What a remarkable promise. For Israel, yet future, there is a repentance. There is a repentance coming. Not because they deserve it, not because they're entitled to it, but because God is merciful. And it will bring Israel to spiritual life and salvation. This is a promise of spiritual life throughout all the Old Testament passages that refer to the new covenant. And I've listed some there for you. Deuteronomy 30 is the promise of circumcision of heart. We can turn to Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31 is sort of the classic passage on the new covenant. This is the new covenant passage that gets quoted again in Romans and in Hebrews. And I want you to listen to the nature of God's promise in this covenant the recipients of God's promise in this covenant. I know it's tempting in in our day as Christians to think about the new covenant as for me. But I want you to listen to how God words this promise. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And this is exactly how it gets quoted in both Romans and Hebrews with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand, that is the Mosaic covenant. This is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares Yahweh. I will put my law within them. On their heart I will write it. I will be their God and they shall be my people. They will not teach again, each man his neighbor, each man his brother, saying, Know Yahweh, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares Yahweh. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. Thus says Yahweh, who gives the sun for light by day, and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. Yahweh of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from me, declares Yahweh, then the offspring of Israel also will cease from being a nation before me forever." For thus says Yahweh, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundation of the earth searched out below, then I also will cast off all the offspring of Israel for all that they have done, declares Yahweh. 
Do you see how God is putting his own integrity on the line with the future of Israel? And not just the fact that they exist. I mean, it's a remarkable thing that the nation of Israel exists today and that Jews as a people exist as a distinct ethnicity, as the target of untold atrocities and multiple attempts at annihilation. They still remain. That alone is a testament to God's promise here in Jeremiah 31, that they won't cease to be a nation before him. But furthermore, God's promise is not just to keep them around, but to bring them to repentance and faith by the new covenant with forgiveness of sin. That will only come about by faith. It will only come about when they look back on Messiah whom they crucified and mourn for him. And they will do that by the spirit of grace and supplication. And so a last promise we'll survey this morning is the restoration of Israel. I want you to look at Ezekiel chapter 36. And by restoration of Israel, we mean that God is going to keep his promises that he made to Israel. Not just some of them, but all of them. All of those unilateral, unconditional promises that God made, that he stakes his own integrity upon, he will keep with Israel. And I would encourage you to read all of Ezekiel 36 and 37. I'll just highlight for you, uh, beginning in verse 21 of Ezekiel 36. I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel profaned. Do you hear that? God is eager to vindicate his own name, his own glory. He's eager to see that everybody knows his word does not fail. And he's doing that with the people who have profaned his name. God's promises to Israel are not a denial of their sin. But it's an upholding of God's word. Verse 22, Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord Yahweh, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. Then the nations will know that I am Yahweh, declares the Lord Yahweh, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, bring you into your own land, and I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols, Moreover, I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. You will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers, so you will be my people, and I will be your God. And you can keep reading. It's interesting that every one of the new covenant passages include spiritual realities and physical realities. In other words, Israel gets a new heart to love the Lord and the land. And what's tied to Israel's repentance is Israel's restoration. And this is where Paul is leading us in Romans 9 to 11. He wants us to know that the word of God has indeed not failed. He's going to prove this point in these three chapters by essentially reminding us that this was always part of the plan. Promises made to Israel included a recognition of her disobedience, her exile, her return. One day her rejection of Messiah, and then one day her acceptance of Messiah, repentance and faith and restoration to the land. This is important for us. It's important to remember that God's promises don't go away. That God's promises can't be reneged on by changing circumstances. That God will not go back on what he's promised you, believer, because of sin. And if he could, we would all be in so much trouble. God keeps his word. His word does not fail. God's word will not fail. God's word cannot fail. And even though most of the promises we've just read have not yet been fulfilled. By the way, put a time stamp on promises of God. Some things have been fulfilled already. 
Uh, Things about Jesus' first coming. You can read an Old Testament prediction about Jesus' first coming and see how it was fulfilled very literally, quite at face value, and you can put a date on it. And those promises that are still outstanding, I just write in the margin of my Bible, when, question mark. Not if, but when, O Lord. When will you follow through on this, your word? God has given us promises that are still outstanding. And you know, we can trust him even when the apparent answer to the promise is beyond reasonable human hope. You know, in the early 1800s, it was probably beyond reasonable human hope that God had a plan for Israel. And there's been a regathering of Israel to the land. Not a repentant regathering. Not a fulfillment of these promises. But a reminder that God still has his people. We're still under the times of the Gentiles. The fullness of the Gentiles has not yet come in. But God keeps his promises. And you and I can bank on God's promises even when they seem humanly impossible. Israel's rejection right now, by the way, paves the way for Gentile inclusion, which itself will pave the way for Israel's ultimate belief. The problem of Israel, Romans 9 to 11, is the problem of the integrity of God. It's not as though the word of God has failed. And Paul's answer to that in Romans 9 is the reminder that salvation is always by grace or election, as he calls it, not obligation. God is not obligated to give anybody anything because of their merit or their heredity, but God saves by grace. In chapter 10, Paul is going to answer this question by reminding us that salvation always comes through faith in the gospel, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. And in chapter 11, Paul is going to remind us that, God, that the gospel will come to Israel both by remnant and by restoration. That Alexis Myers and Dan Barbakoff of Jewish descent are believers in the church now as a remnant and that one day all Israel will be saved. That day's coming. Their rejection of Messiah is not total nor is it final. At the bottom of the outline, on the web outline, I've given you some resources. I just looked at the clock. I am so sorry. I'm apologizing now that the next generation workers. I put some resources on the web outline for you, some books to read. If you want some help in thinking through the doctrine of election, if you want some help in thinking through the future of Israel and God's promises, those are there for you. I'll just close in prayer and we'll be dismissed. God, thank you so much for your promises. And we can thank you for them because they're good because they're solid, because they're unbreakable. God, nothing can thwart your purposes and nothing can undo what you have promised. Our hope, our eternity, our future depends on these things and we praise you that you are such an anchor. And we pray for greater faith to believe what you've said and we ask it in Jesus' name.